Welcome. My name is Arno Hartholt. I work at the USC Institute for Creative Technologies. Um, my background is in computer science. And at ICT, I work at integrating research and technologies into wider platforms, as well as looking at art pipelines for art production. So what I'll be talking about today, though, is combining all of those different elements and seeing how can we apply virtual reality to clinical care. Now, that's being done under the umbrella of the Met VR Lab, which is headed by uh, Skip Rizzo. He's the director for medical VR. Uh, I'll be doing most of the talking right now, but afterwards we're both available for questions. So I'll introduce the USC Institute for Creative Technologies, uh, go a little bit deeper about MedVR, and then highlight two specific applications. The first is BraveMind. It's a tool for clinicians that can help treat patients that have post-traumatic stress disorder. The second is Strive, which tries to identify how can we best prevent PTSD. Uh, and I'll close with a couple of next steps. So ICT, it's part of USC, and we are located a little bit south in Playa Vista, Silicon Beach right now. And it was stood up in 1999, combining basic research, Hollywood storytelling, game industry capabilities to create experiences that are so immersive and compelling that people react to them as if they are real. And we use that then to train and educate people. A lot of it is for the US Army, a lot of interpersonal training, and more and more for the medical domain as well. Now, we're roughly 150 people uh, big right now, a lot of professors at USC, a lot of staff, you can see here the breakdown. Uh, I'll show you a brief introductory movie and then delve a little bit deeper into that. The University of Southern California Institute for Creative Technologies is a university-affiliated research center working in collaboration with the Army Research Lab. The Institute for Creative Technologies, or ICT, was born out of the Army's desire to raise the bar in simulation. To tackle that challenge, we combined the magic of movies and the engagement of video games with world-class academic research to create immersive environments and experiences. But that was just the beginning. Today, ICT has established itself as a leading force in creating experiences that matter. Through research and development, ICT creates experiences that revolutionize how we teach, train, heal, and help. So, what would you like to talk about today? The future will be virtual, augmented, and wearable. Yet ICT researchers know that all this technology will only have value if it is accessible and meaningful to the people who need it most. Our scientists are part of USC's deep and wide-ranging research and development expertise. And our award-winning leaders in artificial intelligence, graphics, virtual reality, and narrative. Their mission is to create immersive technologies that make it out of the lab to solve real problems in the lives of soldiers and civilians. ICT's work with virtual humans creates digital characters that look, sound, and behave like real people. Hi, hope you weren't waiting long. Welcome to SimCoach. They act as tutors, coaches, and role play partners to improve student performance. Our extensive research and focus on the human dimension led to a series of games and immersive experiences that provide cultural awareness and leadership training used throughout the military. ICT's innovations in creating realistic environments make it possible to create virtual reality exposure therapy aids for the treatment of those suffering from post-traumatic stress. A platform for sensing and understanding emotions in real humans can make virtual characters more realistic, but also helps clinicians identify signs of depression and respond effectively. All this is made possible because we work to make our research a reality and put it directly into the hands of users. This might require transforming off-the-shelf devices for new, cost-effective and beneficial uses or deploying innovative technology that changes the face of education and entertainment. Virtual and augmented environments can be used to help people in the real world. ICT has already provided valuable ways for people to interact with digital technology. Now, we look ahead for the next generation of solutions that benefit students, service members, and society as a whole. This is the power of cutting-edge science, focused on the human dimension. This is the power of ICT. 
So as you can see, we work on a lot of different areas, but we like to look at it in these five main research areas. And a good way of looking at this is that one of our missions was initially to create the holodeck from Star Trek. Now, this is a metaphor, but it's a metaphor that guides what areas we want to research in deeper. So starting with the Mixed Reality Lab, it's headed by Mark Bolus. A uh, lot of work in head-mounted displays. An early version of the Oculus Rift was created there. We had a do-it-yourself cardboard viewer a couple of years before Google released one. And we have on the left, as you can see, a head-mounted projector, small Pico projectors that in combination with special reflective screens allow people to share a common environment but see their own virtual reality elements projected on a screen. That means it allows you to have your correct perspective and it also means that you can give different content to beginners as you would to uh, advanced people, all in the same shared space. Now, a while back, they, uh, at the last SIGGRAPH, they, together with the USC School of Cinematic Arts and uh, the, the engineering school, created a movie that won the Immersive Realities Contest, and what they call it Near Field VR. They created the ability to capture stop-motion uh, objects and put it in a virtual reality environment. Now, I can't show the entire movie for time reasons, but I implore you to, to look at it. But I'll show you the last snippet. On, at the top, you see a couple of the stop-motion animation elements. At the bottom, it explains how you can use a virtual space that's fixed to create a larger virtual space. There's more. We have developed a unique redirected walking toolkit which enables the exploration of the entire menagerie in a small physical space, like a living room or even on a stage in front of hundreds of computer graphics enthusiasts. First, we place waypoints near areas of interest that we wish to sequentially visit. We then plug in the dimensions of our walkable tracked space, set perceptual thresholds, and load the experience. As the user begins traveling from one point of interest to the next, our algorithm injects translations and rotations that cause the user to walk on a real path that is different from the perceived virtual path, effectively compressing real motions to a given bounding box. Our system is unique as it dynamically optimizes parameters among multiple redirection techniques based on the user's real path. Graphics, then. The graphics lab is headed up by Paul DeBevic, uh, and they are particularly well known for recreating the real world into a digital space. Uh, most well known for the light stage, which you can see in the middle, that allows you to capture real people in a variety of different angles with a variety of different lighting uh, configurations. That then allows you to create a digital double that you can put into a digital world and match the lighting of both the environment and the character. Um, that's been used in a lot of movies, Avatar, Benjamin Button, Spider-Man, uh, and a variety of others. And more and more we're now also looking at transitioning that technology to a real-time uh, solution. So here you can see work from uh, a while back together with Activision and, and NVIDIA. This is a completely digital character. Um, this was scanned, performance capture was done, and you can see that the fidelity is quite high, all in real-time on commodity hardware. Because we use the light stage, you can again, you can use a different variety of lighting conditions and get this character to look and blend well within the environment. It also means that up close, you can see an incredible amount of detail in, uh, in, in these kind of characters. Now, learning sciences then, we look at two elements. How do people learn and how do people teach? On the teaching side, a lot of teaching is implicit. What knowledge do you have? What kind of procedures do you follow? So you make it explicit, put it in models, allowing us to create training applications that help students learn. Now, because it is a model, we can keep track of how well they're doing, are they hitting all their learning objectives, and afterwards, we can give them an after actual review, or alternatively, throughout the experience, we can guide them through an intelligent tutor. On the social simulation side, it, it starts really small, say one-on-one -on -one conversations. And uh, there's, there's this theory of mind principle that you may very well be familiar with, the fact that I think, that you think, that I think, etc. We expand that to a small group or a larger population. You can run simulations on how certain decisions uh, affect the entire population down the line. What you see here is a, an example called Urban Sim. And it's something we created for the army, which is basically a sim city for uh, nation building. So as a young officer, uh, you need to make decisions about how you apply your resources. How do your decisions, what are the second and third order effects? Virtual humans then 
here we aim to create, in fact, digital role players, virtual role players that mimic us real human beings. So we do research on individual components. How do we understand speech? How do we understand language? How does dialogue work? How does a person use their body like I'm now doing, gesturing, supporting my speech, moving my lips, looking at all of you here? And how do all these elements come together? So we create the individual capabilities we create a platform that integrates the different capabilities, and that allows us to uh, develop virtual humans for a wide variety of different applications. And later I show a couple that uh, are more health related. Now, when we look at the, the MetVR lab specifically, it is taking these and other capabilities and looking at how they apply and can be applied to the clinical world. Uh, that is uh, sociological, psychological, uh, cognitive, motor rehab, and a couple of other areas. So I'll show you a couple of examples before we discuss VR in more detail. Here you see a motor rehab application. It's an early prototype of how people that have a certain physical disability can play games that can be tailored to their specific needs to allow them to have fun while rehabilitating. And we're currently working on a, on a future update of that. On the virtual human side, there's an example here called Vida, Vita, that we created in collaboration with the Demerino Foundation. Here we created virtual interviewers that uh, allow young adults that have high-functioning autism to practice job interviews. So you select your character, you select your disposition, and then you can practice these interviews. Hi, thank you for coming in. It's nice to meet you. So this is a nice start. It's a soft touch disposition. You can crank that up to neutral and then to hostile, and then you get something like this. Let's get started. What made you want to apply for this job? The idea is that you can have these different settings, the different types of jobs, different characters, different dispositions, and you can expand that and, and train over time. Now, what we did then is we took one of these characters and we expanded the capabilities of a virtual interviewer. And what you're gonna see next is a, a, a demo of this virtual interviewer acting as an intake conversation, as an intake nurse. So before a person sees a doctor, this digital character could interview you. If we specifically ask for uh, ways to sort of have you open up about possible mental problems that you have, in particular depression. So in the background, the system is looking at what you are doing with, uh, say, eye contact, prosody of the voice, are you smiling, are you closed up, analyzing all of that. And it was a research project to see if we can identify certain signs of depressions. Hi, I'm Ellie. Thanks for coming in today. I was created to talk to people in a safe and secure environment. I'm not a therapist, but I'm here to learn about people and would love to learn about you. I'll ask a few questions to get us started. And please feel free to tell me anything. Your answers are totally confidential. Are you okay with this? Yes. So, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. That's good. Where are you from originally? I'm from Los Angeles. Oh, I'm from LA myself. When was the last time you felt really happy? Uh, when was the last time? Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not someone who's really like, I don't have any real high highs. I feel like I'm a level person, it's just, Happy? I guess to answer your question, probably, probably a couple months ago. I noticed you were hesitant on that one. Would you say you were generally a happy person? Well, let me mute it for a while. So you can see that all this sensing is used in two ways, actually. What you see here is real-time back-channeling behavior mirroring smiles, head nodding at appropriate uh, times, etc. The second element, though, is that, you know, like I said, this is an intake conversation before you go to, the, to see the actual doctor. This program could, at the end, compile a report of certain elements that 
the doctor may find helpful. So and we found interesting things. For instance, people that have depression tend to uh, have smaller use of prosody in their voice, which is not uncommon. However, they smile exactly the same amount of time of people that do not have depression, yet their smiles are shorter. So all these little things you can start to pick up on and provide more detailed reports just as an indication for a doctor to do their job more effectively. Now, if we look at VR specifically, we see it as a simulation technology. It used to be the case that we can have these old technologies and test and train, say, piloting abilities. Now we can test, train, and treat psychological, cognitive, and motor functioning. And because we are in virtual reality, we use this technology, you inherently have a lot of data in order to analyze and observe uh, the, the real people. Now, an early example is, the, is a virtual classroom. And this was created to uh, uh, diagnose kids whether they have ADHD or not. So you can see here uh, a person who is in a classroom. And there are distractors like auditory. Uh, maybe uh, the teacher walks away, a bus drives by. You can see how the kid is really looking at all these distractors. A, clini a clinician can then change these distractors and you can record all of that data. You have all this data now and now you can analyze it and you can see that kids that have ADHD tend to look around more. And you can see, well, to what extent do they tend to look around more? Even more interesting is that you can play that data back and visualize the differences. Where a normal kid would be distracted temporarily and go back at the task at hand, at some point an ADHD person that has ADHD uh, you know, gets distracted and never gets back to the task at hand. Specifically looking at anxiety disorders then, um, there's often a certain stimuli that has a link to a perceived threat. I see a spider, oh my god, I'm gonna die. That link may not always be valid. And the idea of exposure therapy is to help confront those feared stimuli and to show that not in all cases that is necessarily a bad thing. And virtual reality is a great tool for these kinds of anxiety disorders. And it's been used for, for many, many years, and I'll show you a couple of examples. Uh, Crossophobia, for instance. In virtual reality, now we can manipulate the environment that is either difficult or cost prohibitive to do. Everybody can close the door, but to make the walls go closer and closer is a lot more difficult to do. Fear of heights. We can put you wherever you want to be where, or not want to be. That's pretty fast. Wow. Great. You want to dangle your foot over the edge? How does that feel? Feels pretty good. With the price of computing power coming down fast, it won't be long until virtual reality systems could be cheap enough for every therapist to have one in their office. And it will become even harder to tell where the virtual world ends and the real one begins. Whoa, whoa! Oh, oh, wait, Very good. you know, that is really something. I've had my eye on the floor, <laughs> and the floor good. really came up at me. Well, it's the motion. In the Don't do this at home, kids. So it won't be long in 1995. Fear of flying, we can put you in planes. Uh, social phobia, addiction, there's many different applications and a lot of research in the past decades on how to use virtual reality for the benefit of, of people, fear of public speaking, etc. Looking specifically at Brave Mind, the background is that after and during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, a lot of soldiers came back and had mental health problems. The estimates range from 10 to 30 percent, but regardless, we're talking about tens if not hundreds of thousands of people that have mental problems, a lot of them post-traumatic stress disorder. One of the challenges is that there's a lot of stigma about that. They, you know, it's a, somewhat of a macho culture. How do you seek help? You know, when you break your arm, it's, it, it's clear that you need to find help. When you break your mind, it's a lot more difficult. Well, one way is to make it sexier, add technology, but there's a, a lot of inherent use of, of virtual reality here as well, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail. But give you, I'll give you a short overview. Brave Mind is a form of virtual reality exposure therapy that combines video game-based simulations with one of the most widely used evidence-based therapies. 
making use of the University of Southern California Institute for Creative Technologies, expertise in immersive technologies, and emotional storytelling. BraveMind is a treatment option with appeal for today's digital generation. BraveMind gradually recreates trauma-relevant scenarios that clinicians can use to help patients confront and process difficult memories in a safe and supportive environment. So the idea is that you offer these stimuli as part of a clinician-led overall treatment plan. And it used to be the case that clinicians would just talk one-on-one -on -one with patients. Now close your eyes, tell me what happened, imagine that you're here. But one of the symptoms of PTSD is avoiding actively those kind of memories. So this adds an, you know, a visuals and auditory and sometimes other elements that can help people you know, push through these uh, issues. So we built 14 environments in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and the clinician can change a lot about that. Were you in a countryside or in a village? What time of day was it? Was it night? Uh, were there clouds in the sky? Uh, were there a lot of civilians or not? So you can see here a couple of overviews of the elements that are in it. So it's the setting itself and then certain triggers that you can activate. like a car bomb going off, an ambush, uh, an IED in the distance. All of these can be controlled by the clinician. By going through it there, it's not going through my head at night when I'm trying to sleep or when I'm with my wife, when times when I don't want it to, to come up and me start thinking about it. Traumatic things are not normal. You cannot handle the, the things that you've seen and done. And this is a tool that has helped me out tremendously. Reliving the worst moments of his life has helped him to move on with his life. I'm probably about 80% of who I was before I left, but I think that's pretty good after seeing and doing the things that we've done. For Nightline, this is Dan Harris in Atlanta. Okay, going back in time a little bit, who has heard of the game or played the game Full Spectrum Warrior? Quite a handful. So that was originally designed at ICT, and then a commercial version was created by, by Pandemic. Now, the nice thing about it was that it allowed us as ICT to create those assets, and we created a very quick prototype of a virtual Afghanistan and Iraq, did usability testing in Iraq, and based on that, we got funding to, to build it up over time. Now, one of the challenges is the fact that, you know, it can't replace a clinician. It really is a tool. We're not making a dock in a box here. Really what it is, it's yet another tool that the clinician can use to strengthen the treatment plan for particular patients. And that means we need to give control to clinicians. So here you can see an example of a panel where a clinician is the director of the virtual environment. Where were you? What time of day was it? What's happening right now? All of these can happen, can be triggered by the clinician. Now, like I said, it's a long treatment plan, 10, 11, 12 weeks, so it's very gradual. All the things you see where everything is exploding, that hardly happens. First, you start sitting in the virtual reality environment. Then maybe the appropriate setting. Then maybe we bring in sound and, and bring in civilians, etc. cetera. Uh, Head-mounted displays being used, obviously. Optionally, you can have a rumble floor so that you can really feel explosions. You can have uh, smells and a variety of different uh, control panels. A gamepad works, but you can also have a, a gun that allows you to use that. Looking at clinical research, one of the first things we did is a very small uh, study at Camp Pendleton. And you can see here the first bar is the pre-treatment score of the PTSD checklist for the military, quite high. After one week after the treatment, it is a lot lower, and three months it's even lower. Uh, we're doing more extensive testing currently right now, but, but this is uh, uh, encouraging initial success. Uh, two extensions that uh, we've worked on so far. First is Medifac sequences. As a Medifac, uh, you have a very difficult job. You need to not only operate on sometimes gruesome looking wounds, as any doctor would, they are your buddies. They are your friends that you now need to operate on and try to stay calm. After that, you're still with your buddies. You still need to keep up a brave face. And this is very, very difficult. And so we created specific content for medics. I'll keep this playing, but uh, in, in the meantime, uh, another th extension we did is for sexual trauma. There is uh, more and more a sentiment uh, more and more is it becoming explicit that there's a lot of sexual assault in the army for both men and women. What we created is an environment that can be used for those kind of people that have PTSD. 
we don't actually focus on the assault itself. We only provide the context, the settings, the feeling of being trapped, of being alone, of being in the dark, of being cornered, of being followed. All of these, those are in here. Um, really quickly, I'm going to highlight Strive, which is, you know, if, if BraveMind is on the back end treating with people with PTSD, on the front end, we want to avoid uh, people getting PTSD. Can we train people to be resilient? Can we identify which people are more susceptible to PTSD? So we call this the emotional obstacle course, and it allows us to uh, look at a variety of different sensors and see how people respond and react to high stress. The background here is that the army is moving towards uh, a way where the psychological fitness is as important as the physical fitness and towards prevention rather than treatment. So we created uh, six episodes, a sort of Band of Brothers experience, a narrative in which you walk around, drive around with your buddies, but at the end of each episode, something uh, important and stressful is happening, like an IED attack. <laughs> Go, go. This, this is vehicle three. Go, we just go, got hit. Go. We're down. We're down. Or a civilian death. Now, the idea is that we measure how people respond to that and see what we can learn in terms of preventing this. Um, next steps then. One of the things we want to do with Brave Mind is create a prototype for Vietnam veterans. They are often overlooked. Uh, a lot of them are retiring right now. A lot of problems are coming up. Uh, and, and uh, like I said, often overlooked and we can't find the proper funding. So hopefully we'll start a crowdfunding campaign soon. So if in a month or two you see an invite, please remember this talk. Looking at you know, where we are in the renaissance of virtual reality. What is out there? Hardware, software, what can we use to make these experiences more engaging while still serving the ultimate goal of helping people that have PTSD? We're looking at civilian translations. PTSD in terms of uh, first responders, firemen, firefighters, policemen, it's skyrocketing. These kinds of tools often start in the army in terms of technology, but can be transitioned to the civilian world. The recent string of terrorist attacks is something that we're actively looking at. We're collaborating with various partners in Paris to see can we quickly create a scenario that would help those people. Not immediately relevant, but after, say, six months, that's when the nightmare starts. That's when you're starting to see problems. We want to turn Brave Mind in a very specific Iraq Afghanistan application to a platform that allows us to rapidly prototype these uh, scenarios and stimuli in order to help people that have gone through traumatic experiences. Um, now, ICT is a nonprofit organization. Um, but even in a commercial sense, besides entertainment, the estimates are that healthcare are the next biggest thing in virtual reality. There's a lot of interest here and a lot of things that we can do here. And really, our aim at the ICT is seeing how can we take VR, how can we help other people, how can we spread this out here. And it is something, you know, everybody says we're in a renaissance. It can affect a lot of people. I agree with most of you probably that it will take a few years, but you can see that it will affect everybody from young to old. And to end on that note, um, I will introduce to you Skip's mom. It's so real. My God, it looks like my backyard, my yard with the snow. Oh, Lord in heaven. How they ever can create this. You know what? I'm hanging on to the sink because I'm afraid I'm going to fall down, down the cliff. <laughs> yeah, honest to God. You feel like, oh, you, you, if you step off, you're going to fall right in there. Holy mackerel. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, Skip and I are both here. Any questions? I don't know how much time we have left. So you, you show a bunch of different kinds of impact. Uh, what are you using nowadays? I mean, there's a lot of lasers out there, but you can just tell from a stand, things have changed a lot. Um, 
uh, at the moment, we still use some of the legacy hardware, and the, uh, we're in the middle of upgrading everything to Oculus uh, Rift and Vive as our main targets. Left. It's not something we at the moment are focused on. Um, really, we want to offer people environments and stimuli of past experiences, or at least trigger those, those, those elements. It doesn't need to exactly match, because we can never do that. But you want ways to, to trigger those experiences. So I personally don't see it in that area. I do see it more in the motor rehab, where you can create games that include the environment for people to rehabilitate. Sure, yeah. Uh, the question is, in terms of regulation, uh, how do we deal with all of the, the rules that are in place? So we, we're a research institute, so we started the research. What works, what doesn't work? Um, the, the brave mind um, um, elements that I showed you are, pro are not new. They're basically taking a decade-old uh, treatment, uh, treatment, prolonged exposure therapy, and adding a VR component to it. So in that extent, it's nothing novel there. What we typically do when it does get pushed out more, we work with other industry partners or, or, or others to transition software for commercialization or wider adoption. So the question is, what if you give VR to, to doctors? Um, I think it, it comes back to what we saw, a couple of the things this morning. It allows you to be in different places at once collaboratively. It allows you to help people from a distance. Some of the work we've done is in telemedicine. So the movie you saw of, of looking at people's faces, at body postures, and seeing if there's signs of depression, you can do that through Skype, for instance. So you can make all those detections online. So those are elements that we're looking at. I cannot hear you at all, sorry. I'm sorry, I still, what was the question there? Yeah, OK, the question is about uh, can we influence behavior of certain people? Uh, that's very interesting. And, and in USC, we've done a couple of studies there. And we're hoping to kick off a larger study in using virtual humans in those kind of elements. So a, a digital body that would help you either, if, if you're sick and on the schedule, take your medicine on time or help you exercise and really see what are the elements that are necessary there, what are the elements that are unnecessary. OK, one final question. One final question. <laughs> Not on my end. I make the, the, the capability and hand them out. So I, I don't know about any specifics. I assume that they clean it just like they clean other stuff. It's a long answer of saying I don't know. <laughs> That's a more interesting last question, or at least last, uh, more interesting last answer. That is something that we're going to look into hopefully next year. So far, we have not done that. I mean, people need to train to use these systems in particular. But again, it's in the context of existing treatment methodologies. So not something we've tackled on uh, yet, something we are definitely interested in. Thank you all.